The crankshaft, sometimes abbreviated to crank, is responsible for conversion between reciprocating motion and rotational motion. In a reciprocating engine, it translates reciprocating linear piston motion into rotational motion, whereas in a reciprocating compressor, it converts the rotational motion into reciprocating motion. In order to do the conversion between two motions, the crankshaft has crank throws, or crank pins, additional bearing surfaces whose axis is offset from that of the crank, to which the big ends of the connecting rods from each cylinder attach. It is typically connected to a flywheel to reduce the pulsation characteristic of the four-stroke cycle, and sometimes a torsional or vibrational damper at the opposite end, to reduce the torsional vibrations often caused along the length of the crankshaft by the cylinders farthest from the output end acting on the torsional elasticity of the metal. History, Western World, Classical Antiquity a Roman iron crankshaft of yet unknown purpose dating to the 2nd century AD was excavated in Augusta Raurica, Switzerland. The 82.5 acm long piece has fitted to one end a 15 acm long bronze handle, the other handle being lost. The earliest evidence, anywhere in the world, for a crank and connecting rod in a machine appears in the late Roman Hierapolis sawmill from the 3rd century AD and two Roman stone sawmills at Gerasa, Roman Syria and Ephesus, Asia Minor. On the pediment of the Hierapolis mill, a wheel fed by a mill race is shown transmitting power through a gear train to two frame saws, which cut rectangular blocks by way of some kind of connecting rods and, through mechanical necessity, cranks. The accompanying inscription is in Greek. The crank and connecting rod mechanisms of the other two archaeologically attested sawmills worked without a gear train. In ancient literature, we find a reference to the workings of water-powered marble saws close to Trier, now Germany, by the late 4th century poet Ausonius. About the same time, these mill types seem also to be indicated by the Christian Saint Gregory of Nyssa from Anatolia, demonstrating a diversified use of water power in many parts of the Roman Empire. The three finds push back the date of the invention of the crank and connecting rod back by a full millennium. For the first time, all essential components of the much later steam engine were assembled by one technological culture. With the crank and connecting rod system, all elements for constructing a steam engine are Euro Heroes Iol appeal, the cylinder and piston, non-return valves, gearing a Euro were known in Roman times. Middle Ages The Italian physician Guido da Vigevano, planning for a new crusade, made illustrations for a paddle boat and war carriages that were propelled by manually turned compound cranks and gear wheels. The Luttrell Psalter, dating to around 1340, describes a grindstone rotated by two cranks, one at each end of its axle. The geared hand mill, operated either with one or two cranks, appeared later in the 15th century. Renaissance the first depictions of the compound crank in the carpenter's brace appear between 1420 and 1430 in various northern European artwork. The rapid adoption of the compound crank can be traced in the works of the Anonymous of the Hussite Wars, an unknown German engineer writing on the state of the military technology of his day. First, the connecting rod, applied to cranks, reappeared. Second, double compound cranks also began to be equipped with connecting rods, and third, the flywheel was employed for these cranks to get them over the dead spot. In Renaissance Italy, the earliest evidence of a compound crank and connecting rod is found in the sketchbooks of Tacola, but the device is still mechanically misunderstood. A sound grasp of the crank motion involved is demonstrated a little later by Pisanillo, who painted a piston pump driven by a water wheel and operated by two simple cranks and two connecting rods. One of the drawings of the Anonymous of the Hussite Wars shows a boat with a pair of paddle wheels at each end turned by men operating compound cranks. The concept was much improved by the Italian Roberto Valturio in 1463, who devised a boat with five sets, where the parallel cranks are all joined to a single power source by one connecting rod, an idea also taken up by his compatriot Francesco di Giorgio. Crankshafts were also described by Conrad Kaiser. Leonardo da Vinci and a Dutch farmer by the name Cornelis Cornel I. So on van Wittgeest in 1592. His wind-powered sawmill used a crankshaft to convert a windmill's circular motion into a back-and-forward motion powering the saw. 
Cornel I. Soon was granted a patent for his crankshaft in 1597. From the 16th century onwards, evidence of cranks and connecting rods integrated into machine design becomes abundant in the technological treatises of the period. Agostino Ramelli's The Diverse and Artifactitious Machines of 1588 alone depicts 18 examples, a number that rises in the Theatrum Machinrum Novum by Georg Andreas Bar paragraph CKLE out of 45 different machines, one third of the total. Middle and Far East, Al Jazari described a crank and connecting rod system in a rotating machine in two of his water raising machines. His twin cylinder pump incorporated a crankshaft. But the device was unnecessarily complex indicating that he still did not fully understand the concept of power conversion. In China, the potential of the crank of converting circular motion into reciprocal one never seems to have been fully realized, and the crank was typically absent from such machines until the turn of the 20th century. Design Large engines are usually multi-cylinder to reduce pulsations from individual firing strokes with more than one piston attached to a complex crankshaft. Many small engines, such as those found in mopeds or garden machinery, are single-cylinder and use only a single piston, simplifying crankshaft design. This engine can also be built with no riveted seam. Bearings The crankshaft has a linear axis about which it rotates, typically with several bearing journals riding on replaceable bearings held in the engine block. As the crankshaft undergoes a great deal of sideways load from each cylinder in a multi-cylinder engine, it must be supported by several such bearings, not just one at each end. This was a factor in the rise of V8 engines, with their shorter crankshafts, in preference to straight-8 engines. The long crankshafts of the latter suffered from an unacceptable amount of flex when engine designers began using higher compression ratios and higher rotational speeds. High performance engines often have more main bearings than their lower performance cousins for this reason. Piston stroke The distance the axis of the crank throws from the axis of the crankshaft determines the piston stroke measurement, and thus engine displacement. A common way to increase the low speed torque of an engine is to increase the stroke, sometimes known as shaft stroking. This also increases the reciprocating vibration, however, limiting the high-speed capability of the engine. In compensation, it improves the low-speed operation of the engine, as the longer intake stroke through smaller valve, S, results in greater turbulence and mixing of the intake charge. Most modern high-speed production engines are classified as over-square, or short stroke, wherein the stroke is less than the diameter of the cylinder bore. As such, Finding the proper balance between shaft stroking speed and length leads to better results. Engine configuration The configuration and number of pistons in relation to each other and the crank leads to straight, V or flat engines. The same basic engine block can be used with different crankshafts, however, to alter the firing order. For instance, the 90 degree V6 engine configuration. In older days sometimes derived by using six cylinders of a V8 engine with what is basically a shortened version of the V8 crankshaft, produces an engine with an inherent pulsation in the power flow due to the missing two cylinders. The same engine, however, can be made to provide evenly spaced power pulses by using a crankshaft with an individual crank throw for each cylinder, spaced so that the pistons are actually phased 120 a degree apart, as in the GM3800 engine. While production V8 engines use four crank throws spaced 90 a degree apart, high performance V8 engines often use a flat crank shaft with throws spaced 180 a degree apart. The difference can be heard as the flat plane crank shafts result in the engine having a smoother, higher pitched sound than cross plane. See the main article on cross plane crank shafts. Engine balance. For some engines it is necessary to provide counterweights for the reciprocating mass of each piston and connecting rod to improve engine balance. These are typically cast as part of the crankshaft but, occasionally, are bolt on pieces. While counterweights add a considerable amount of weight to the crankshaft, it provides a smoother running engine and allows higher RPM levels to be reached. Rotary engines Many early aircraft engines had the crankshaft fixed to the airframe and instead the cylinders rotated, known as a rotary engine design. 
rotary engines such as the Wankel engine are referred to as pistonless rotary engines. In the Wankel engine the rotors drive the eccentric shaft, which could be considered the equivalent of the crankshaft in a piston engine. Radial engines The radial engine is a reciprocating type internal combustion engine configuration in which the cylinders point outward from a central crankshaft like the spokes of a wheel. It resembles a stylized star when viewed from the front, and is called a star engine in some languages. The radial configuration was very commonly used in aircraft engines before turbine engines became predominant. Construction Crankshafts can be monolithic or assembled from several pieces. Monolithic crankshafts are most common, but some smaller and larger engines use assembled crankshafts. Forging and casting Crankshafts can be forged from a steel bar usually through roll forging or cast in ductile steel. Today more and more manufacturers tend to favor the use of forged crankshafts due to their lighter weight, more compact dimensions and better inherent dampening. With forged crankshafts, vanadium microalloy steels are mostly used as these steels can be air-cooled after reaching high strengths without additional heat treatment, with exception to the surface hardening of the bearing surfaces. The low alloy content also makes the material cheaper than high alloy steels. Carbon steels are also used, but these require additional heat treatment to reach the desired properties. Iron crankshafts are today mostly found in cheaper production engines where the loads are lower. Some engines also use cast iron crankshafts for low output versions while the more expensive high output version use forged steel. Machining Crankshafts can also be machined out of a billet, often a bar of high-quality vacuum remelted steel. Though the fiber flow do a Euro unregistered trademark T follow the shape of the crankshaft, this is usually not a problem since higher quality steels, which normally are difficult to forge, can be used. These crankshafts tend to be very expensive due to the large amount of material that must be removed with lathes and milling machines, the high material cost and the additional heat treatment required. However, since no expensive tooling is needed, this production method allows small production runs without high costs. In an effort to reduce costs, used crankshafts may also be machined. A good core may often be easily reconditioned by a crankshaft grinding process. Severely damaged crankshafts may also be repaired with a welding operation, prior to grinding, that utilizes a submerged arc welding machine. To accommodate the smaller journal diameters a ground crankshaft has, and possibly an oversized thrust dimension, undersize engine bearings are used to allow for precise clearances during operation. Fatigue strength The fatigue strength of crankshafts is usually increased by using a radius at the ends of each main and crank pin bearing. The radius itself reduces the stress in these critical areas, but since the radius in most cases is rolled, this also leaves some compressive residual stress in the surface, which prevents cracks from forming. Hardening Most production crankshafts use induction hardened bearing surfaces, since that method gives good results with low costs. It also allows the crankshaft to be reground without rehardening. But high performance crankshafts, billet crankshafts in particular, tend to use nitridization instead. Nitridization is slower and thereby more costly, and in addition it puts certain demands on the alloying metals in the steel to be able to create stable nitrides. The advantage of nitridization is that it can be done at low temperatures, it produces a very hard surface, and the process leaves some compressive residual stress in the surface, which is good for fatigue properties. The low temperature during treatment is advantageous in that it does not Euro unregistered trademark T have any negative effects on the steel, such as annealing. With crankshafts that operate on roller bearings, the use of carburization tends to be favored due to the high hertz and contact stresses in such an application. Like nitriding, carburization also leaves some compressive residual stresses in the surface. Counterweights, some expensive, High-performance crankshafts also use heavy metal counterweights to make the crankshaft more compact. The heavy metal used is most often a tungsten alloy but depleted uranium has also been used. A cheaper option is to use lead, but compared with tungsten its density is much lower. Stress on crankshafts, 
The shaft is subjected to various forces but generally needs to be analyzed in two positions. Firstly, failure may occur at the position of maximum bending. This may be at the center of the crank or at either end. In such a condition the failure is due to bending and the pressure in the cylinder is maximal. Second, the crank may fail due to twisting, so the conrod needs to be checked for shear at the position of maximal twisting. The pressure at this position is the maximal pressure, but only a fraction of maximal pressure. See also References Sources, Hall, Bert S., The Technological Illustrations of the So-Called Anonymous of the Hood Site Wars. Codex Latinus Monocensis 197, Part 1, Wiesbaden, Dr. Ludwig Reichert Berlag, ISBN A3-920153-93-6A, Alfred Hall, 1953-6A-Al-Hussein-Ahmad-Y-Hill-Donald-R-Islamic-Technology-An-Illustrated-History-Cambridge-University-Press-ISBN-A0-521-42239-6A-Labbalat-Rudolf-Far-One-Quarter